When Friday the 13th shocked the world during the summer of 1980, earning about $39 million at the domestic box office off a budget of around 500 grand, it was no surprise that Hollywood would attempt to replicate that success. The ensuing year saw a veritable glut of slasher films set in every imaginable location. Still, the easiest place to set one of these hack and slash ripoffs is the woods. Easy on the wallet and closer in spirit to the movie that created this bloody frenzy, there are plenty of forgettable titles that came and went with only the hardest of the hardcore fans still aware of their existence. But one of these movies stands out from the rest thanks to its charismatic cast, its brutal kills, and its memorably ghoulish villain. That film is The Burning, and we're gonna get nice and warm with it on this edition of the best horror movie you never saw. If I were to say, name a Miramax film starring Holly Hunter, most people would think The Piano, the 1993 prestige film that won Hunter an Oscar. But we're not most people, are we? You better believe I'm talking about The Burning. That's right, the film that started out as the brainchild of now disgraced producers Harvey Weinstein and his brother Bob, who back then were attempting to get their company off the ground. Seeing how the horror movie market was coming alive thanks to movies like Halloween, the brothers decided to make a low-budget horror flick that would cost a little and hopefully make a lot. Along with the future CEO of Paramount Pictures, Brad Gray, the group concocted The Burning, which was partially inspired by the legend of a boogeyman named Cropsey who supposedly terrorized helpless children in Staten Island, New York. Supposedly a treatment for the film was registered before Friday the 13th came out, so while its release may have made it seem like just another Friday knockoff, the seeds for the burning had been planted before that movie's immense success. I like it a lot. Using the legend of Cropsey as a jumping off point, the producers crafted the tragic tale of an antisocial caretaker who is nearly burned to death after a prank goes very wrong. <laughs> After recovering, the caretaker, of course, named Cropsey, quickly takes out some of his rage on a prostitute and then heads back to camp to slice up whoever's in his path. Whether or not Cropsey takes a bus there or rents a car is not divulged. What he finds there is a camp bustling with kids and some very adult camp counselors, though once in town, he doesn't mind taking it easy and waiting for the right time to strike. In fact, after the murder of the prostitute, it takes well over 30 minutes to get to the next kill, right around the 49 minute mark. Talk about a slow burn, even an A24 horror movie wouldn't wait that long for the next big death sequence. You're fond of me lobster, ain't you? Drunken in a Virginia fan. I seen it. You're fond of me lobster. While we wait, we get to know the various counselors and their superficial dramas, all while eagerly anticipating the moment the blood hits the fan. The film's most infamous sequence comes 10 minutes after the previous kill, and it more than makes up for the wait. Five eager counselors paddling to an abandoned canoe, gleefully ignorant that they're about to be dispatched in the most shocking of ways. The ominous music steadily builds, alerting the audience to the danger, so when Cropsey finally arrives and mows these kids down in about 10 seconds flat, we're both horrified and perversely satisfied. While most slashers are content to kill off its cast one teen at a time, the burning lays waste to a batch of them so abruptly that we barely know what hit us. Shot way upstate in New York near Niagara Falls, The Burning was directed by London-born Tony Malum, who'd previously had two of his documentaries distributed by the Weinsteins. He was given a reasonable budget somewhere in the million dollar range, which wasn't bad for an indie horror movie in those days, but still low enough of a budget that the cast had to provide their own costumes throughout production. The Burning isn't flashy, but it always sets the right tone, a carefree summer where only main concerns include childish pranks and getting the opposite sex 
to notice you. And when things get horrific, Malam lays on a feeling of dread and takes no prisoners when it comes to getting gory. Malam was even closer to the gore than you might expect, as he's playing Cropsy in most of the murder scenes. The story goes that Malam believed he was the only one who could hold Cropsy's signature garden shears just right for the camera. Makeup effects legend Tom Savini, who turned down Friday the 13th Part 2 to work on this production, provides the monstrous gore effects, and thanks to Cropsy's unquenchable bloodlust, Savini gets the chance to stage some of his most impressive kills. The massacre on the raft happens so quickly that you could miss some of Savini's DIY magic, but damn if it doesn't look gnarly when Fisher Stevens loses his digits. The only slightly iffy effect comes when we see the blade come out of Ned Eisenberg's neck. Wish they'd made the melding of his head and fake chest slightly more realistic. That said, the sequence works like gangbusters and makes us glad Cropsy prefers sharp objects to get the job done. He has a tendency to go for the juggler. Perhaps the grisliest death belongs to Boris Campjock Glazer, who finally seems like an okay guy after spending most of the movie being a humorless jerk, but it's too little too late for the man as he receives a visceral death that looks believably agonizing. The effect of him flying through the air was achieved by the actor Larry Joshua holding on to two poles as crew members dragged him backwards with Malem, once again acting as Cropsy. As for the character of Cropsy himself, Malin wisely keeps him and himself hidden in the shadows for the majority of the movie, only really giving us a look at his twisted face once or twice. Savini was somewhat unhappy with Cropsy's look as he didn't have enough time to work on that ugly mug, but when shown in small snippets, it certainly works. Cropsy gets his just desserts in ghastly fashion at the end of the day, a fate hard to come back from. There were apparently brief talks about making a sequel to The Burning, but those talks never led to anything concrete, so as it stands, Cropsy remains dead, and the film stands on its own as a one-off, and that's okay. Not every slasher requires a sequel. We're gonna carry on and plan the sequel, cause let's face it, baby, these days, you gotta have a sequel. The fact that The Burning is a one and done might even make it more special. The cast is led by a couple of suitably unmemorable but pretty people, but the supporting cast is where it's at, with supporting turns from Jason Alexander, Fisher Stevens, future Fast Times at Ridgemont High star Brian Backer, and the aforementioned Holly Hunter, all effective in their respective roles. Alexander in particular stands out as a very affable presence. The movie's insistence on biding its time before unleashing hell ensures you get to know these folks, and if everything goes right, you'll be shaken up if they catch a blade across the throat. Maybe it was for budgetary reasons, but The Burning could have killed off a few more characters if it had really wanted to, and its body count of 10 seems like restraint when compared to the number of corpses the other early 80s horror movies piled on. Another way in which The Burning sets itself apart from others in its genre is that there's no final girl. Well, not technically, anyway. The showdown at the end belongs to Brian Matthews' Todd, who turns out was one of the little shits who helped ruin Cropsey's good night's sleep, as well as his entire body all those years ago. Todd is helped out by the camp creep Alfred, played by Backer. Alfred might just be the strangest character in the film, a peeping Tom who makes it very difficult not to root against him, yet just pathetic enough to earn at least a smidgen of sympathy. Supposedly, the original ending took place in a cave, but when the producers discovered said cave was overflowing with bats, they decided to move it to a dilapidated mine shaft. Alfred was also supposed to die originally, which might have brought smiles to the faces of people who can't stand the slack-jawed dork. When it was released in the spring of 81, the burning had survived some slashes of its own from the MPAA. Supposedly, the producers had two different cuts of the film, one for countries where extreme violence wasn't a problem like Japan, and a softer cut for places that didn't tolerate blood and guts. One such place was England, where the film earned a reputation as one of the infamous video nasties and was subsequently given an X rating. Oh, yeah. Yeah, baby! Yeah. Now the burning can be seen in its original uncut form for whoever wants to spend some time at Camp Stonewater. 
The film didn't exactly set the world on fire when it was released theatrically, blending in with the competition and disappearing from public consciousness, though it did do well in Japan, fittingly enough. But as it happens with cult classics, it took some time on home video for the true audience for the burning to get wise to its brutal ways, and now the movie is seen as an important part of slasher movie history. Appreciated now is its patience, its enjoyable cast of likable young up-and-comers, and of course, its nastiness and the plentiful red stuff that ends up dominating the second half of the picture. The Burning is a slasher that manages to cut a little deeper than most of its brethren, and these cuts definitely leave a mark.